We are live with NAL Live. This is our first edition. Excited. We've got the main man, the league commissioner, Chris Siegfried with us. How's it going, Chris? Hey, it's going good, Andrew. Thanks for having me on. Really excited about the launch of this new show, NAL Live. I'm excited to see where it goes. Uh, appreciative of you of putting this all together for us and, and basically being the engine behind NAL Live. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's such a great tool for the league and and all the teams to just be able to get out there. And, you know, I, I like to get to know people. And a lot of the fans mm -hmm. want to get to know you guys, you, you as the commissioner, the coaches, players, a little bit more than just on the field and, and in the office. So I think this will give us a great opportunity to kind of, you know, get up close and personal, you know, with, with the league personnel. And then, you know, kind of break news, you know, keep the fans updated with information throughout the year. You got such great stuff in the works right now. Some stuff you can talk about and some you can't right now, but um, we're going to be able to help get that news out to fans on a regular basis. So, you know, it's it's exciting. So thank you for the opportunity to help you guys out. I've got a big passion for uh, arena football. You know, you and I have met, you know, I, I feel old because we've, we've met, you know, years ago. I think it was uh, 2002 or three. So um you know it's an exciting exciting time for what you guys got working but chris walk me through kind of your career where where'd you get started where did you where'd you go to school and grow up um all the way up until uh where you're at now as commissioner of the league <laughs> well there you go that's what happens when you go live so we need to work on getting uh commissioner siegfried um some uh updated uh internet okay, here back. So I just was saying that we need to get the commissioner some updated internet. So <laughs> I got fiber optics, man. I don't know what's I don't know what's going on, but it's been going on and off. It's for the last probably minutes. my kid upstairs streaming on his uh, Twitch and everything else for his video games. I told him to get off of that. <laughs> yeah, we, well, listen, we've got, we've got a lot of people. Of We've got a lot of people tuning in so far. Uh, right before you jumped off there, I was I was just saying, hey, kind of walk us through your career. Where where did you grow up? Uh, where did you go to college? And kind of your career up until now. Well, I went to college up in Millersville uh, University, up in Lancaster, PA, D two football school. Uh, had a good time up there. You know, we were a pretty good team. I, I think I was above average. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> but we came down my senior year, which was 1991, and played against UCF. Uh, they were 1AA at the time, trying to make the transition to, to, to go to the Division 1A. And uh, I remember we were practicing in the snow at least one day up there. And uh, it was 80 degrees night before the game at like 10 o'clock at night. And I'm like, <laughs> why would anybody live in Pennsylvania? <laughs> so uh, I graduated that December and, and moved down here in January and, and you know, I've been a resident of Central Florida ever since, since uh, January of 1992. But uh, came down here in 92, tried out for the Predators, an open tryout. Uh, that's where I met Les Moss and, and his uh, dad, the late Harry Moss. And uh, they saw something in me that they liked and signed me on the spot, went through camp. And uh, I was a number five receiver on a team of studs. I didn't realize how good they were at the time. Uh, but I was the next guy in. And uh, unfortunately for me, nobody got hurt, and they all, all were some of the best players in the league. You know, Barry Wagner and you know Herky Wall, and uh, you know never got a shot. Had a great time. Was basically a practice squad guy the whole year. Learned a lot. Learned a game. You know, Ben Bennett was the quarterback at the time. And uh, the next year, they invited me back, and I had a good talk with Coach Moss, and I said. Uh, do I have a chance of breaking in this lineup? And he basically said no. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had to go out there. Uh, Hit the road. His Hit the road. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, you're he's going to go to camp, but basically I was relying on somebody else's misfortune. So I'm like, well, you know, I went down and played for a team called the Miami Hooters. And when I say played for the team, I got hurt in the preseason and uh, never saw the field in the regular season. I, I just – I was wondering if, if it was me, if I was good enough or, you know, what the deal was. It just seemed like everything was, you know, lining up against me. So 94, 
went overseas and played for a, a league called the United Football League. We played a, a, a scrimmage and had this big exhibition game in Taipei, Taiwan. And uh, it, everybody was excited and they were promising us all this money and everything is going to be great. We're going to play over in Asia. You know, so I moved down to Bowling Green, Kentucky, which is where the headquarters was. And I mean, like two months later, the league folds. So I'm just like, <laughs> what am I doing? Uh, so I went back down to Florida, regroup, was working, uh, was working for a car dealership for a couple months in uh uh, a friend of mine who had seen me work out a number of times, uh, Jim Pop, was uh, the general manager of the Baltimore Stallions in the Canadian Football League. And he called me up and said, uh, hey, come up and try out. We're bringing 10 receivers in and we're going to sign the best one. So I'm like, I'm good. I'm there. So I went up and my mom and I said, hey, mom, whatever happens, if I'm not good enough, just be honest with me. Because apparently I'm either lying to myself or others are lying to me because I keep getting – contract offers and I keep getting cut or hurt. So it's frustrating. Uh, I made the team on the spot. I remember. Yeah. I remember him showing me the contract. He's like, I just signed it. He goes, you don't want to read it. And I'm like, for what? <laughs> <laughs> They're not going to so change it anyway. I mean, $40,000, a hundred thousand. It doesn't matter. I'm going to, I'm going to play. I'd play for nothing at the time. And uh, I remember being on the practice squad up there and I was doing really good. And uh, I'll never forget the week I got cut. Uh, I think I was up there about four or five weeks, maybe less, might have been three weeks. I don't know. But remember this guy coming in, we were staying in a hotel and this kid was like six foot five, you know, big, tall, white guy comes in the, uh, the room. And I looked at him. I said, man, please tell me you're a quarterback. <laughs> so, he said, no, I play receiver. I was like, oh. <laughs> the dude just got cut from the 49ers. Yeah. He just got cut from the 49ers. I was like, man, I'm out of here. He goes, he goes, nah, man, don't say that. So we went to practice the next day, and he's like, man, you're really good, you know. And I, sure enough, I got cut that week. I was like, come on, man. So, uh, you know, I went back down, regrouped in Orlando. Were and, you still uh, thinking, like, were you still in your mind, like, hey, I could still play? Or were you starting to think, like, oh, no, absolutely. Know, I, I'm going to go coach? or No, nah, absolutely. No, I, coaching was the, the last thing on my mind. So I went back. Back down to Florida and, and went, went to another job. I was working for house loading. Uh, Consolidated no job. Are you still with us, Chris? All right. I'm okay, back. here we go. <laughs> We're gonna get it. We're gonna figure this thing out. I'm trying a different uh Wi-Fi thing in my jig, so hopefully okay. that works. Uh, anyway, so went back down and, and it was ninety five and I remember uh Back then, the American Gladiators was really big, you know, the TV show. And I was just like, man, I want to be on that. Matter of fact, uh, I played over in Taiwan with this guy that they called Two Scoops, who was considered like the best contender ever. You know, he won like when they used to go to Europe and they take all the best contenders. This guy would this guy would won like he won the national show and he won like the international show or whatever it was back then. And I remember him telling me, he said, man, you need to get on the show and we can compete against each other. And I'm like. All right, I'd love to get on the show. So I heard this ad for American Gladiators tryouts. It was like May of 1995 or, or thereabouts, you know. Uh, that's a long time ago, so I don't remember the exact month. But uh, I thought I was going to try out for the television show. So I'm all like, I'm about to say, hey, let me go home and get a couple hours sleep because I was working 12 to 12 midnight to 8 in the morning. And tryouts were like at 8 in the morning. So I, w I left work early, got a couple hours of sleep, went, went to the tryouts, and, you know, as a football player, you're in, you're in tryout mode, you know? So I was like prepped for all these workouts. They did 40 yard dash, a shuttle, they did pull-ups and all this stuff. And I'm like, you know, I'm killing it, you know, I'm doing really well. Right. So, uh, next thing I know, it's like, we're trying out for this live dinner show. And I'm like, 
all right. Well, I was disappointed. But then when he told me about it, he's like, no, you're going to be on salary. You're going to perform every other night. I'm like, well, what happens if we lose? And like, no, you're on the show. So I'm That's like, OK, a- <laughs> so unlike the Courtney on TV, if you lose, you're, you're done. Right. Yeah, yeah. You go home. You suck. Right. Uh, but this was like a regular job. So I'm like and they were promising us all this money. And, and you know, in the beginning, it was really good. We were making a lot of money. And then all of a sudden, it's like, well, we got to cut the budget and we got to do this. <laughs> you know, we're like, oh, my gosh. But we did. And actually, I met my uh, my now wife. I met her. I met her doing that show. She was uh, she was my partner on the show. And we had a lot of fun with that. We did it for about almost three years. Uh, during that time, uh, I think it was 97, I actually got a workout for the Raiders when they were training in LA, but they were about to transition back to Oakland. And uh, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, she's like, Oakland. She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm going to go try out for the Raiders. She's like, you play football? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I play football. <laughs> like, I had no idea. I was like, well, when they introduced me on the show and they talk about football, what did you think? She goes, oh, I thought they were making it up. I was like, <laughs> so, uh, so I remember I was 27 years old and I went out and tried out for the, for the Raiders and I had a great workout. It was a private workout, which I thought there'd be a bunch of guys there, but they literally had a guy out there throwing to me. They ran me in a 40 and a shuttle and did all these routes. I felt like I did good. So come in and I talk to the guy and he's like, Hey, we really like you. We'd like to bring you to mini camp. And, you know, he starts talking to me about when I was born and whatnot. He goes, he goes, wait, you're 27 years old. I was like, yeah. He goes, well, your agent said you were 23. And I'm like, I could be 23. (laughs) (laughs) So he's like, listen, he goes, you're an average size guy. You know, you're decent speed, but you're not great speed. He goes, you're a long shot to make the camp roster. And he, he started breaking down to me because let's say you're good enough to make the, you're, you're the best one in this mini camp and you're going to get invited to be on the, on the camp roster. He said, you're competing against veterans, guys we drafted, and you're the, the last guy there and you have to beat out all these guys. But let's say you do that. He goes, most likely you're going to make the practice squad and then it's going to take three years to develop you. And then you're going to be 30 years old. And I looked at him, I was like, yeah, I probably wouldn't sign me either. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's not a good business decision. They, I mean, not that they were going to sign me. I mean, maybe in my heart of hearts, they were going to sign me, but he kind of broke it down the business of it. I'm just like, wow. I'm like, you know, because in my mind, if you're good enough, you're going to make it. I never thought about the business in 27 years old being old. I, I felt like I was a late bloomer because I was not very big in college. Not that I was ever very big, but at the time I was about 200 pounds. I was. Did you know, that crush you? Bad. Did that like crush your, you know, your dreams right there? No, I mean, no, because it wasn't somebody telling me that what I bad. wanted to hear. Like, oh, you know, you right. just need an opportunity. It was somebody telling me about the business of football, which I, I could relate to that. You know what I mean? So I knew I had some strikes against me. I mean, I'm 5'10". I'm, I mean, I went to a Division two school. You know, I felt like I had good speed, but I didn't have great speed. You know, I was, I was a four or five guy on grass when I was in – in shape. I mean, I just felt like hard work and determination and all that stuff will overcome the fact that I'm not six foot two. A Disney a made picture. for TV movie right there. <laughs> Had I made it, it might have been. Right. <laughs> this is that movie that, you know, when you don't make it. <laughs> Keep trying, I mean, kid. But it's reality for a lot of people. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of people out there, they need to be, you know, realistic somewhat. Uh, I mean, obviously you don't want to give up on your dream, but also, you need to be somewhat realistic, and well, you know, doesn't mean you still can't play at a high level. But a story doesn't end there. I didn't finish the story. Okay. <laughs> no, but you're right, though, and, and absolutely because for me, the journey was worth everything I went through and did. All the failures that I had made me the person I am today. Well, in late '99, I was working as I got my real estate license and my real estate appraising license. You know, we we chatted about that at an earlier time, and. Uh, I remember I was sitting in an office doing real estate. I was doing commercial real estate appraising. I was getting trained by some some really good people in the industry. And I got a call from uh, Brett Muncy. And Brett was the defensive coordinator for uh, the Augusta Stallions, which was a new arena team in this new league called the AF2. And he's like, hey, man, like Brett and I were, were teammates in 1992 with the Predators. And he's like, hey, uh, are you still in shape? I was like, yeah, man, I'm always in shape. He goes, 
you want to play arena football? I was like, come on, man. What are you talking about? He goes, well, we're starting this new league, you know? And he said, we want you to, we want you to come and work out for us. And I'm like, all right, now let me set the stage for you. I just got married, right? It was, uh, it was like November or December of 1999. And uh, my wife was, uh, she was actually pregnant at the time. Uh, and I'm working a job with full benefits. She's managing a, 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 an Einstein Brothers Bagels in, uh, here in Florida. And I go to work out for Brett Muncy and Mike New at, I don't know, we were, I think we were in Winter Park or somewhere. And I went out there, kind of did my thing. And they're like, hey, man, we want to sign you. I was like, great. He's like, uh, I was like, how much does it pay? He goes, $200 a game with a $50 win bonus. So I'm like, all right, well, don't tell my wife about that. I'll have to figure that one out. <laughs> so ironically, uh, or unfortunately for my wife, she knew I was kind of like in a rut. I wasn't happy working in a desk job. And she just told me, she's like, hey, find something you love and go for it. And don't let anybody tell you what to do, right? This was like a, a few weeks earlier, maybe a couple months earlier. So I, I got the contract. All right, don't leave us in suspense now. All right, well, we'll go through some of these until he gets back. Oh, hey, Pat, thank you. Enjoying it. I was watching your show earlier. Good job with the Pred Talks. All right, I'm back. All right. I put up a couple of questions on the screen while uh, while you were on. Yeah, it. Cool the whole thing. Well, well, anyway, long story short. This is a great I, one. Uh, <laughs> I like <laughs> That's good. That's good. So, uh, But anyway, I signed with the Augusta Stallions and uh, had a great season. I had a great statistical year. Played all the games. You know, team captain. Was, was very honored to play it. But at, towards the end of the year, Coach New was saying, hey, man, you'd make a really good coach. And at first I was like, well, what are you trying to tell me? You know, so he hired me as an assistant and then he ended up leaving. And I had an opportunity to become an offensive coordinator for an expansion team to make in Knights in 2001 under Kevin Porter. So I jumped on that opportunity and we went and uh, my contract was for ten thousand dollars. And I thought I was rich, man. And uh, <laughs> I made it. No, and I made it. it. So, uh, you know, my wife uh, shortly thereafter became pregnant with our with our second and last child, our daughter, Bailey. And uh, so we were living in an apartment in Macon, Georgia. And I remember my first game. I didn't really know what I was doing. So I had a piece of paper with like five routes written on it that I that I was coaching. And we scored like 61 or 62 points, but we lost. So but we had a really good year. We were 10 and six. You know, Coach Porter got coach of the year. And the very next year, I became a head coach. Basically, I was third in line, and the first guy turned it down. The second guy turned it down. When I was offered the job, I took it, looked at my wife. I was like, I, I don't know what I did, but I'm a head coach now. <laughs> so, <and laughs> don't I don't know what I, this the means. Coaching career, yeah, the coaching career just kind of happened and uh, just worked really hard at it and just tried to get better every year and, you know, tried to sign good players that were, you know, believed in you know, my philosophies, which were basically like work hard and the best player plays. And, you know, but that whole experience led to a 12 year coaching career that, that I really have no regrets of doing it. I enjoyed it. And, you know, all the trials and tribulations, you know, there's fun stories to tell, but, you know, maybe at the time they weren't so funny, but, you know, 20 years later they are. Uh, uh, but I love the game. Your... I mean, more because I love the game. First gig was that in uh, Cape Fear? First head coaching gig, yep. Yeah, okay. So that was 2002, so, yep. How hard was it going from, you know, playing to coaching? Was there, like, any resistance by you? And, you know, because you're – I mean, even even now, you know, years later, I mean, you're still fit. You're still a competitor. So, like, when you were coaching, were you out there, like, running routes with the guys and, like, you know, being real real hands-on like Absolutely. that? Was it <laughs> – how Absolutely. often did you suit up in practice? You know, I do not have to run – What's that? How often did you suit up in practice? 
Oh, I never suited up. Never. Oh no. Okay. I would just like sometimes run around and show them how to run them, but uh, right. like in the early days, especially in Cape Fear, I would I would do the conditioning with the players, and I did that for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted to try to stay in shape, but two is a good way to monitor how much conditioning was too much conditioning, because I felt like if it was too much for me, then it was too much for the guys. So I didn't want to over condition the guys. Uh, you know, it, it was it was getting in shape for playing arena football is is a, is a tough balancing act, and you want to make sure you're not beating up their legs so that they're useless in practicing in the game. So, you know, I took the conditioning really seriously and tried to ease the guys into it. And you got to condition alignment different than receivers and DBs, but uh, you know, the receivers and DBs, it's kind of in a way, it's kind of like basketball. They have to be able to run all day. And, you know, once you cut down to your, your roster limit, whether it's 24, 25 players, you don't have all these practice squad players to, to practice with. You basically have an, a couple extra guys and that's it. So you got to be really you know, weary of too much, uh, too much work on their, on their bodies. So, uh, but no, I didn't suit up. No. I, I didn't tried that once hurt. like for practice just to, I just had to get, get some hits in, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, when, when, we were in Cape Fear, we had this, when we were in Cape Fear, we had this uh, news reporter that, you know, was like, hey, I think I could play. And I was like, all right, why don't you come to practice? So we set it up and he came to practice, you know, because from the stands, people don't realize how big and physical these guys are, you know. And yeah. Like even like now, if you go to a high school game, especially here in Central Florida, like an 8A high school game. They don't look so big, and then you go down, and you realize, gosh, these kids are. And they're men, almost. Really, really big. I mean, the local school here has got the six foot five receiver. They got a six two receiver, and just like, I mean, these the, the kids are big nowadays. But the same yeah. thing back then, you know, these guys keep getting bigger. So this news guy comes in, he's like, suits up because I, you know, I think I could do it. So he ran like pat and go and a couple routes. And <laughs> after a couple, we're like, this guy's gonna get hurt. So he came over by me and I kind of like, I was like, Hey man, why don't you sit this one out? And he goes, thanks coach. I said, listen, they're pretty good. Aren't, aren't you? Aren't they? And he goes, yeah, they're, they're so much bigger and faster thought. I'm like, I've been trying to tell you, these guys are really, really good, you know? And, and uh, it was an eye opener for the, for the beat writer. And after that, he always reported favorably on us. Yeah, so a couple a of years time. back. But I spent three years a couple of years back, we kind of did a deal where um, the teams could uh, dress uh, a celebrity uh, roster spot, and uh, <laughs> what it it was it it was good and bad, you know. Um, you know, like you had like the mayor of a city suit up. Um, you had sponsors. You had like it was like fantasy baseball, like like where they play like at spring training or whatever, and. Uh, but they pay, they pay for it. So it's like, you have somebody that's going to pay for the whole game, you know, checks for the guys. Basically you let them suit up, you give them the Jersey. Uh, but we were crazy enough to like, let them actually get in a game at some point, typically like on like a special teams, but um, they realize it's not, <laughs> these guys are big and, and fast. So yeah. I would, you know what, I think in concept, it sounds great. Uh, I would worry about what happens when the guy breaks his neck or uh, because <laughs> it's yeah, just, oh, yeah. these guys are so big and physical now and it's, people just yeah, don't get it. And if you're, not, you're not doing this every day and every week. And, and these players, when someone like that comes on the field, Especially on the other team, they're not wanting to take it easy on them. They're they're wanting no, to, you know they're set the to, tone. <laughs> set that yes. tone. So it would have to be like at a golf course, you know, have the hole in one challenge. <laughs> We'd have to have a lot of insurance, you know, a lot of insurance. I, so, de- I wouldn't want someone get seriously injured at a game like that. As much as I'd welcome having somebody, you know, basically pay for a game. I don't know if it if the uh, injury aspect is, outweighs the the cost benefit. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, we got some some comments here. I'll throw up on here every now and then, but uh, um, you know, um, going back to um, your coaching days, I remember because we met 
you know, probably early on in your, your head coaching career. Uh, I always remember you had pretty solid teams. Like how many, did you win any championships or, um, you know, titles during that time? So we won one championship in 2006 uh, when I was coaching the Spokane Shock. It was an expansion team that year. We won a bunch of conference uh, and division titles, you know, throughout the years, uh, but only got to the big show once. And, uh, and it was great, you know, so out of the 12 years coaching, nine of those were as a head coach, got fired twice. Uh, and the other coach, if you haven't been fired, I mean, that's what I hear. It still doesn't feel good. It still doesn't feel good. But, uh, so those two seasons, I was two and six and two and six, or maybe it's two and eight. It was bad. Whatever it was. I think it was two and eight both years. Uh, and the other years, the, the other seven years, I, I was fortunate to win 90 games. So, but for whatever reason, like Cape Fear ended up, they sold the team in 04 and then they moved it to South Georgia. So that was another expansion team. And then I, that was the first time I got fired was 05. So I got hired as the expansion uh, coach in Spokane in 06. We won a championship. And at the time, AF2 and AFL were still separate. And, uh, I took a job as the offense coordinator in Kansas city with Kevin Porter again, who hired me the first time because I wanted to go to the AFL. I wanted to coach at the highest level. Obviously hindsight being 2020, had I known the mer the teams were going to merge, uh, the leagues were going to merge. I probably would have never left Spokane because it was, I mean, we really loved it out there. Uh, Good support know, so, too. Yeah. It's, it's the great support. It was just, it was just one of those, areas that you know we hit a home run and you know every team not only my team but the the teams and coaches after it everybody was successful and the fans just fell in love with it and uh it's just a great place to be but so i went on to kansas city helped turn around that team and uh in 2007 but in 2008 i didn't get an opportunity to be a head coach in the afl so i went back to af2 in arkansas and i uh, coached there in 08 and 09 was 11 and five both years. Uh, and then, you know, in 09, the AFL folded and then 20, I'm sorry, no eight, the AFL folded after 2009, the AF two folded. And then they came together and formed the, the new AF one or AF 2.0 or whatever they wanted to call it. The, the, the in-between version of both leagues. Right. So I was out of a job again, this time because the league folded and, uh, I remember the you know closest opportunity was Jacksonville and, and Les Moss, you know, lives uh he lives about forty five minutes away from me even today. And I remember driving up to his house. I called him, I said, Hey, you know, I'd like to interview for the job. And you know, he was like, Well, you know, you can come talk to me sometime. So I basically showed up on his doorstep, knocked on the door, it's like, What do I gotta do, man? <laughs> so uh he hired me and didn't have much money left in the budget, but that was fine. Uh I just needed to stay active in the game. And uh after that 2010 season, and that was a great season. We were 12 and four. Uh, Les got coach of the year, I believe, and uh, got the job up in Pittsburgh in 2011. Uh, another expansion team, and uh, we had a great season, nine and nine. Uh, you know, Bernard Morris was my main quarterback. You know, even though we were nine and nine, he probably missed seven, eight games. But had he been healthy the whole year, we probably we probably would have won a, a you know 11 win team, maybe a 12 win team, and then. Uh, 2012 happened. It was the, the labor strike year. <laughs> and uh, the rest is history. Got fired after two and eight that year. My only two wins were against Orlando. <laughs> I'll never forget the owner saying, hey, you know, he, he basically forced me, you know, forced me to cut the entire team, you know, cuts my quarterback. And, and he's like, don't worry about it. We're good. I'm like, you, you just don't find quarterbacks that could play this game off the street, man. So, uh, 10 games into the season, after they swore up and down, I was the guy, just ride it out. They fired me. I remember them calling me and asking me, hey, don't say anything. And, you know, we want you to resign. I'm like, everybody in football knows if you resign, you're getting fired. So I'm like, no, you're going to fire me. I'm good with it. It doesn't bother me. You know, yeah. I mean, I mean, it sucks being fired, but let's call it what it is. When somebody resigns, when they're not doing good and they resign, they got yeah. fired. Yeah, they exactly. Kind of save face. And, you know, I, I, what it I, is. I would never say anything negative about any team. And I still, you know, am very appreciative of uh, the ownership group up in Pittsburgh. They did a lot for my family personally off the field. 
we didn't necessarily see eye to eye on the football operations, but uh, uh, they're still good people. And uh, I still appreciate the opportunity. And, and honestly, it helped me springboard into my real estate career that I'm doing today and uh, has allowed me to, to rejoin football in this role with the, uh, with the NAL. So it's a long winded and, career story. And so how has that been like, you know, cause you know, just being around you, I could see, you know, how big of a competitor you are. And so like, did, did you kind of take that with you into the real estate and, you know, attack that or, or is, do you have a totally different, you know, kind of mindset, you know, in that? Well, it's, it's a toned down competitiveness, you know, because like, I, I don't know, I think ne negotiating contracts, I like to win contracts. So if, if a buyer, like if I'm working with a buyer and they, and we don't get a house that they want, I, I kind of, I, I get a little mad because I'm like, okay, this is, it's a loss, right? Yeah. yeah. But I mean, uh, so that part of it's, you know, fun, the competitive nature of it. But what I really do like about real estate in general is, is the impact, the positive impact it has on people, especially a first time home buyer. And for me, work, when you work with buyers and I work with both buyers and sellers, probably 60, 40, you know, but when you're working with buyers, it's, it, it's like, it kind of feels like you're buying the house every time they buy a house. It's kind of a fun process, you know, uh, but working with first time home buyers and to see how much they go through to just get a house for the first time, it's extremely gratifying uh, on a, on a personal level. So that part of it, I really, really enjoy because buying a house is one of the best investments you can, you can make. So if you're moving to central Florida, I'm your guy. And if I'm not your guy, Andrew's your guy. Yeah, so exactly. I'll be, I'll be your sidekick with my new license. So absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> There's, hey, I'll tell you what, this this market is booming here, and uh, I think it's a great time to be involved and also to purchase uh, real estate. So uh, it's good to see you do that. And what's cool about real estate and what you're doing is you're you're able to kind of manage that with your role with the league. Like, so how did you, you know, <clears throat> kind of get that call for the NAL, and how, how did all that come about? Because you you were done kind of coaching at that point, right, for a few years. Um, how did all that come about? Well, I, actually it came about because of my relationship with uh, Jason Gibson in uh, Columbus, you know, Jason called me up, starts talking to me about this concept that he had. And, uh, you know, I was like, man, I, I don't know. I don't know if I want to get back into it. And, you know, uh, I remember negotiating with the owner of his team at the time, they were negotiating for me, uh, for my salary. And, uh, the owner was like, hey, uh, I mean, I, I've got a good relationship with Jason. So because he was involved and, and he kind of sold me on it, I went up to a press conference that they were announcing some stuff. So uh, but then the owner was like, hey, we really want you on board. What kind of salary, you know, do you uh, do you need? <laughs> Obviously, understanding the economics of the sport, uh, I wanted to be realistic. And I said, well, I said somewhere in between zero and 200,000 a year would be good. It's a good starting point. And, uh, and I remember him saying, you know, uh, you know, somewhere closer to zero, not Jason, but the, the <laughs> previous one, it's, it's going to be the closer to zero. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I said, I said, listen, you know, what I don't want to do is that I don't want to, I don't want it to cost me money. So if I have to go somewhere, I, I like it. I like to be paid for, you know, if I have to get a hotel, I would like to be reimbursed. Right. And I said, I'll jump on board and, you know, we'll see where this thing goes. And the first season, which was 2017, I was, you know, director of football operations. You know, I helped put together the uh, uh, ops manual, the rule book, you know, I, I, and I still update that stuff today. You know, uh, transactions did all that stuff, you know, kind of everything you do as a coach at this level times all the teams, you know, and in addition, you know, I'm, I'm the bad guy that has to find players and coaches when they do things wrong, but that's how it started the first year. And then they offered me the, the commissioner job in year two. And I was like, well, I sh should get a little bit of a pay raise for this. <laughs> so, so we're talking uh, more money. Yeah. So, uh, you know, every little bit, every little bit counts. And, um, uh, but I'm realistic about it. You know, I'm, it's not a, it's not a huge uh, source of income, but 
I believe in what we're doing and uh, I like where we're going. I, we have some great ownership groups in this league and we're continuing to, to get better. We've made a lot of mistakes along the way. I've made mistakes and it's just a matter of, you know, try not to make the same mistake twice. And, you know, let's see if we can make this thing grow. And, and our main focus going into 2021 is, is stability, you know, and, and we just want to, the goal is to have this sport around for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, leagues and teams have failed in the past. And, you know, for us, it's how can we learn from that? So, uh, you know, here we are today. What do you think needs to be done, you know, to be successful? Like what what are you going to do or the NAL um, to kind of continue in that, that path to success? Well, I think we need to do a better job collectively helping each other out. You know, too many times it seems to me from looking from the outside, looking into other leagues or even the AFL or AF2, it seems like everybody's concentrating on getting teams in, but then once they're in, you're kind of on your own. So, you know, we've really made a concerted effort, especially after the 2019 season and obviously into the 2021 season, we're missing 2020. You know, we want to try to, you know, not only we need good partners, but we need to make sure that they're going to be successful. You know, the first couple of years in our league, it was just a matter of we're just trying to have a season. The first year, we just try to have a season, right? We're just trying to get things together. And uh, second type, you know, we're just teams coming and going, you know, trying to stabilize everything. So we need it. Like I said, we need to collectively do a better job of helping each other out. That That means teams helping teams, the league helping teams you know, providing more benefit for these teams to want to join our league. You know, obviously we feel like we're the highest level of arena football left in the world. Uh, we do have a, a couple competitors out there and, and competition's good. And, uh, you know, and we've been pretty, pretty transparent when we fail. And, uh, you know, we're not ashamed of the, the mistakes that we've made. So we're going to, probably make more mistakes in the future, but the goal is to continue to grow and be more stable, you know, and, and adding the right type of people that believe in what we're trying to do long-term, not just one year at a time. Well, and I think, you know, like from looking at it, of you know, I don't know, a few, few months ago or whatever, where you guys removed uh, a team or two and, you know, just the fact that you guys are proactive in, you know, making those tough decisions. I mean, that's, that's not easy. And then, you know, everybody online is going to get all worked up, but like, you know, obviously you guys made the decision for the betterment of the league. And, and as the commissioner, you know, I know that you take a brunt of, of everything and it's like, it's a very thankless job. <laughs> like what, what commissioner do people talk about like nicely in any league? I mean, it's, it's brutal because you are the one that has to make you, you enforce the rules that the owners make. Yeah. But everybody forgets that when you enforce them. <laughs> so. Yes. Yes. You know, <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. You know, and let, let me address some of the teams that have left our league in the, in the recent past. It, it wasn't because we wanted to make those decisions. It's, it's just that, you know, we have to, you know, move on when, when it's just not a good fit. And th those teams I'm hoping are going to still be successful and, and maybe we revisit them in the future. But, you know, we're trying our best to get stability in our league, you know, and, and I believe that some of the changes we've made, even in the last few weeks are going to help us in the future. You know, uh, you, you, we have to get better at our expansion process and our due diligence and, and not announcing teams too soon before they have, you know, everything in, in intact. And uh, again, it, it's unfortunate when things like that happen, but, uh, and it's unfortunate because I'm the one that has to be the bearer of bad news. I don't get a vote on anything. I <laughs> <laughs> you just, you know, I that's just, what I'm saying. It's rough. It's a rough, it's a tough position. Yeah, but, you know, so like from the fan perspective, there are some arenas I go to where they cheer me, and then the next time I'm there, they're booing me because I suspended a player or, a, you know, some right. switch. And it's like, you know, it, it's like I'd like to basically tell them, you know, this is this, the rules are black and white to me, you know, and but but it's hard to explain that to fans that are so passionate about their teams and they don't understand why this guy gets suspended or this guy gets fined. 
and or whatever. A lot of times they have blinders on. It's their team. And, and, and you know what? In the very beginning, I sat into what I said. You know, I said, be careful what you wish for. I said, I will follow these rules and enforce these rules to a letter. And every single owner. Be mad at me. at some <laughs> You know, I don't have a dog in a fight. Good and bad, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Well, you know I don't know. My, my screen keeps going black, so I'm hope, hoping I'm still on there. But uh, Yeah, yeah, you're still there. Um, no, but they – What I was saying, you know, is, you know – Go ahead. No, I was just going to say is the, the owners, they, they want you to enforce that until it's against their team. <laughs> you know, how many times have you probably find a team and, you yeah. know, they come back, oh, Chris, come on, man. So – uh, fans I mean, out there that are on, I mean, if you want if to, somebody's uh, got to do the job. Uh, fans, post questions, and we'll try to get to some of those questions. Uh, you can comment on whatever platform you're watching right now, um, and we'll try to have Chris answer uh, as many of those as we can. But uh, let's talk more about you know the expansion, and you know the number one thing that I've been hearing is, well, why the hell did you put a team in LA, and you know, people are like, oh, the travel cost and this and that. And my first thought is, I, you know, I've had soccer teams recently and we fly to every game. And so I've come to realize that sometimes flying is cheaper than taking a bus or, or other transportation. So um, the flights don't really scare me as much as it, it sounds to everybody. But um, how did that come about? And what, what are kind of your thoughts on that extra travel? Well, you know, first off, it, it came about an owner that, you know, made application and, you know, did everything right, did everything fast. And, you know, from a travel standpoint, you know, the teams that have to go out there, you know, we have a, a system in place for them. It's not going to cost a team on the East Coast any more than their most expensive trip. So, We still got you there, Chris. Well, while we're trying to get Chris back, I saw this question earlier about tryouts. I know teams are working on announcing some tryouts for early 2021. So kind of keep keep an eye out on the websites, Austin. I'm sure teams are going to put that stuff out there as um, soon as possible. So make sure you comment. Also include where you're from on the comments. Let's let's uh, kind of see where we're getting everybody from. So I was just doing some PSAs. So you're right. I don't know. I, my internet. I got fiber optics. So I don't know what's wrong with it here in uh, Winter Garden, Florida. Maybe there's just too many people watching us right now, Chris, yeah. and it's just breaking servers worldwide. <laughs> yeah, that's probably what it is. That's that's probably. You know, but getting back to. Uh, Ontario, it's about good partners. And, and you know, we, we have a vision that 20, we're going to get through 2021. And, uh, you know, hopefully a lot of these crazy restrictions are lessened, you know, in the next six months. But uh, we have huge plans for 2022. And, you know, uh, we can't let a lot of them get out too quickly because, you know, quite frankly, you know, things leak out. Sometimes it hurts a league when those happen, but for 2021, you know, we're, we're concentrating on some big things like fantasy football, which, you know, hopefully we have a weekly NAL fantasy live show. Uh, you know, we're going to have weekly injury reports, you know, so the fans are going to be able to play fantasy football in it. We're going to call it NAL fantasy. They're going to be able to sign up and play weekly games, season games. You know, we're, we're still working on setting it up. You know, we have a company that's uh, that's helping us out with that. So we're super excited about that. You know, we're trying to get more fan engagement. I mean, I'm very excited about this this show in AL Live. I'm, I'm curious to see where it goes and where you could take it and uh, hopefully get more fan engagement. And, uh, 
you know, I, I would love to see us have a, you know, we have yearly awards and I'd like to see us have a fan of the year award. Someone that gets flown out to the, uh, to the NAL championship game and, you know, they get their award, they get, you know, backstage passes, whatever we can do for them, you know, maybe have a fantasy player of the year, you know, just for me, I, I just want to see more fan engagement. You know, this sport back in the eighties was built for the fans. Yep. It's a fan friendly game. You know, it's a, it's a party that they happen to be playing football at. So, you know, I always think about ways that, you know, how can we get the fans more involved and how can we make these players just larger than life celebrity type guys, you know, and, you know, obviously we want the guys that, you know, are trying to get an opportunity at higher levels to get those uh, opportunities, meaning the NFL and right now the Canadian leagues a higher level, I would consider it anyway. And uh, we want them to get those opportunities but while they're here in the NAL, we want to make them, you know, stars. You know, there's a number of players that are just so marketable. And, and the way they interact with the kids and the families is, is pretty awesome. You know, and that, that part of the game I really, really enjoy, you know, just watching the, the fan interaction and, and uh, you know, watching these players entertain. Had a big lineman last year ask me about dancing after a touchdown. You know, I think he was trying to. Don't find the guy. Come on, man. No, 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 no. Okay. no, 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 not at all. He's like, you know, well, Mr. Kamish, man, how do you feel about dancing after a touchdown? You know, you going to find me for that? I said, <laughs> only if you're terrible at it. I mean, <laughs> and he like looked at me, started laughing. I was like, seriously, I would encourage you to dance, but please yeah. don't be a bad dancer. Right. Like me, I'm not dancing after a touchdown. No. It, it would not be good. But some of these guys, I mean, do your thing for a couple of seconds. Entertain the crowd. We want that. Yeah. You know, we want it to be fun for the players and for the fans. Just and don't throw those footballs in the stands, guys. Don't do it. Is that a rule for you guys? That is a team-by-team team rule. Okay. <laughs> All right. No, that's fine. But, you know, with, with technology now, content – can be year round. And so I was excited when we started talking about the idea of this show and just, you know, how you and the rest of the owners, you know, are forward thinking and like, let's utilize technology. Let's, let's try to get closer to the fans. Cause without the fans, what are we doing? We're just, you know, we're out there by ourselves and that's no fun. Right. It, it's all about the fans, you know? So, you know, we're not the type of sport that could uh, play without fans and, and thrive without fans we don't have you know hundreds of millions of dollars coming in from these tv networks you know yeah. although we're available for the court for any yeah. TV network that wants to fill in some content you know we'll take that money better than the arena brand of football on on tv so uh so we would welcome that but at the end of the day it's like it's kind of like nascar nascar is just better live yeah. on tv it's okay you know what i mean it's good but live, yeah. you know, you get to hear the their atmosphere. Calls, see how fast they are. And and football on TV in general is is okay. Arena football is better. Right. So live is the best. Live, get the in-game experience, you know. Uh, kids just love it because, you know, there's lights, there's music, there's promotions, there's all this cool stuff. And, uh, you know. Parents love football, you know, they're passionate about it and they're close to the players, unlike the outdoor game, you know, where you're, you know, a lot, you know, miles away, not really, but you know what I mean? So, uh, just nothing to do in our sport. One of the things we did, and I, I can't remember if this was soccer or football, um, but, uh, the one league did a, uh, a fan of the game. So like you would do your players of the game, but then each, each home game, was the fan of the game. I think it was like sponsored by like the cell phone company or something, but uh, it was kind of cool. They got like the game ball and then uh, a photo taken on the field after the game. And, um, but I mean, I think any way to engage fans, um, I think like this being able to take questions from, from fans out there now, um, you know, I think, I think is, is, you know, cr- crucial. You got, I don't know if you remember Bobby Jackson, but he, he remembers some bus trips. <laughs> And, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. so we had the best bus trips in Fayetteville. We did. So sleeper bus or what? Oh yeah. We, we traveled by sleeper bus and, you know, we would give, uh, you know, the players would get their per diem, which was their, their food money for the road. And, uh, we would always, we'd always play a friendly game of cards. <laughs> <laughs> so, so 
there's many games that like I'd never forget. Poor guys game. weren't even eating. Come on, man. <laughs> I would always tell the players, not that we bet on the buses, but should, should there be betting going on, hold back some money so that you don't go broke. Because if you're playing cards with the coaches and Bobby, we're going to take your money. Yeah. <laughs> so, but we had this one game in particular. We were playing the Carolina Rhinos back in the day from Greenville, South Carolina. And uh, it was one of those games where we were getting beat at halftime, and we came back and made an off- awesome comeback. And we always had a rule, an unwritten rule, that if we lose the game, we're not stopping on the way home. But if we win, we may stop and get you Gatorade and water and whatever else you want to drink. Right. You know, they're all adults. Uh, you know, maybe a Mike's Hard Lemonade. Uh, but uh, but we would we would basically party on the bus, right? You know, play cards. The guys would play music, and they'd just be hooping and hollering. Now it was not that way when we lost. When we lost, I'm like, y'all need to be quiet. So you were that coach, like not. I don't yeah. want to hear anything. It's not that I didn't want them to have a good time, but I didn't want them to enjoy losing. Right. So losing you should think not about be it fun. for an 18 hour ride home. Yeah. So, uh, but winning should be fun. So that that was kind of the you know we want them to be quiet when we lost you know what i mean uh fortunately we didn't lose that much so but anyway this one trip coming back from carolina i'll never forget because we 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 were playing cards friendly cards you know non-wagering cards (laughs) most likely and uh we were probably in the parking lot of the uh, crown coliseum in fayetteville we were probably playing cards for two or three hours after we got back (laughs) (laughs) Buster was like, I want to go home. Come on, guys. We had a player who was uh, one player of the year one year, Matt Burstein. Uh, and, uh, receiver, right? Yeah, receiver, stud receiver. I, I actually Doesn't he live him. here in Orlando? But he lives in Fort Myers now. Or, He's oh. in real estate. Actually, Matt Burstein is the guy responsible for me being in real estate. Oh, is he real? Uh, I'll tell you that story next. But, uh, <laughs> but so, Matt, you know, we were playing cards, you know, like I said, friendly cards. And <laughs> Matt might have not been playing as well in the card game. <laughs> we just got to the point where it's like, yeah, we just need to go and everybody just shake hands. I don't want to be too detailed on the, the potential betting. Not that there was betting going on, but if there was, he wasn't doing very well at it. But it was just a, a great time. And, you know, the, the barbecues that we would have and all the memories, you know, the bus trips to me were some of the best memories we had. Brings uh, the team together. Yeah, it brings the team together. and we didn't travel like more than 12 hours, you know, there to Fort Myers, I think it was our longest trip. It was only long when the bus broke down on the way back, which only happened once or twice. But, uh, the worst. but yeah, we had a lot of, a lot of fun on those, those bus trips. And, you know, those are the type of memories that you just, you just appreciate them even more. But speaking of Matt Burstein, uh, who came up with the deuce rule? Yeah. Answer. I, no, I was me. It was, well, there was a couple of us that came up. So I got to give some credit, uh, to Steve Kern about the deuce, you know, but collectively we want to make the kicking game unique. You know what I mean? So uh, I came up with the Uno. Yeah, we stole that one. Which started that yeah. phase, but okay. Yeah, we've got the Uno and the deuce. But uh, speaking of Matt Burstein, he, um, after I got fired in Pittsburgh in 2012, uh, you know, I'd called him, called him up and, you know, we we're talking real estate. He's like, hey man, you need to get your real estate license. So I went down and he was, He's been killing it down in South Florida, you know, doing residential real estate, doing flips and just doing all kinds of stuff. And, and uh, you know, he's a smart kid and, well, yeah, not a kid anymore, but uh, he's younger than me. So he's like, man, just get your license. I spent a day with him. So I went and got my license and I called him up and said, hey, man, I got my license. What do I do next? He goes, well, go get with a broker, dummy. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to help me, man. Yeah, so, uh but no, that was a, that was one of the best decisions I made. You know, followed his that's blindly followed his lead and got my real estate license in 2013 for the second time. And uh, so the real estate story kind of you know happened that way. But uh, but the, the the memories and the 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 players and you know the players having a good time even when they're not making a lot of money and uh, just those memories are, are fun. For me, the road trips were some of the best, and some of the stuff we did on the road was fun. All legal, nobody got arrested, at least <laughs> not while they were with me. Uh, but it was a lot of fun, and, and Fayetteville kind of started it off, you know. And, and Fayetteville was—we probably had the best football operations of, of 
of any organization that I that I coached for. It was just on point, and it's a shame that that team was sold. You know, Roddy Jones was the original owner, and I'd probably still be in Fayetteville if he was still the owner of that team. Uh, just loved working for him, and Bobby was uh, Bobby was my equipment manager. He probably did a lot more that I don't know about <laughs> to keep our team afloat, but. Uh, he always made the deals for the for the Gatorades and the waters and stuff like that. So. But that that's the cool thing about this is, I mean, you know, when you run into these guys, um, there's there's instant memories and and stories, and and you guys are gonna have that for for life. And it, it's so it's such a small circle. I mean, you were talking about how, you know, when you were back with the Predators, I mean, Ben Bennett was there, uh, Les Moss was coaching. I mean, yeah. all these guys are still still in it and and you guys are all working together so i mean i think it's pretty uh pretty cool yeah definitely the memories and and the meeting the people and you know i met a lot of great people along the way and, and not only just people involved with the team but then you know fans and you know people that we became friends with off the field you know especially in fayetteville and some that we still keep in touch with up in spokane and arkansas in Pittsburgh. I mean, everywhere I've gone, there have been people that we've met that uh, we got to know off the field. And, uh, you know, you know, the good ones are the ones that still stay in touch when you lose or get fired. Right. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, no, that's really what it's all about, you know. And uh, I might make my kids both grew up watching arena football. So for them, that's that's the best brand of football out there. And it is. I mean, yeah. The guys just don't get paid like the NFL. So right. maybe one day. You never know. I mean, it just, it starts with, you know, building, you know, little by little, you know, we've got uh, somebody asking about, you know, they missed the Pittsburgh power is, is Pittsburgh an area of interest for the league or any areas that uh, you can share with us? Um, you know, like, absolutely. Pittsburgh could be a definitely great area of interest. You know, uh, I know there's multiple leagues looking at that that market but uh you know again we need to focus on stabilizing what we're doing and we have some exciting stuff that i'm working on behind the scenes for uh 2022 that you know i'll present to the owners here in the in the very near future so i'm just excited about the way we're we're going i mean it's really unfortunate that 2020 had to be postponed or canceled or whatever uh you know no one could have predicted that obviously and even me the entire time, I'm like, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be fine. It's going to be right. fine. It's going to be fine. <laughs> you know, and then all of a sudden it just got to the point where it's like, yeah, we got to just pull the trigger and, and call it. I think we were the last league to throw in the white towel for 2020, but it was, it was tough, you know, and, and um, it's unfortunate because, you know, the teams, the existing teams in our league, that, that was very, very difficult for them, you know, because they don't, they, they, they're losing money by not yeah. playing. Well, kind of talking about that, I'm um, Jack Tanner posted, you know, would the league or has the league considered like a bubble type, you know, schedule? I mean, I think that would be a little tougher with the revenue streams for, you know, what what the NAL has. But um, has there been any discussions on that? There, there was there was uh, right now. The issue with that is we rely on sponsorship and season ticket sales on a per team basis, you know, for something like that to happen, we would have to get a, a sizable league sponsor that could justify the teams doing that. And I, I just don't know that that's anything's possible, but I just don't know if that's realistic, you know, uh, and that, and that's the unfortunate part. So, you know, John, John's over here uh, in Tampa. He's, he's uh, a, arena football guy too. Um, I think he was a GM up in the Omaha beef back in the, a few years, but oh, nice. he wants to see a team back in Tampa. I know he's living over there. He's a good dude. So hopefully uh, that's on yeah. the radar as well. Cause on the radar. Tampa's definitely on the radar. So we'll see where that goes. Anything else that you got going on with the league that you want to share with us uh, today? Well, you know, I think we briefly touched on the, the fantasy football. And, yep. uh, you know, we're going to go uh, live stats during the game. So that's going to be a big, big thing for us as far as, you know, getting the getting the stand, the, the stats to be updated as we go. So we got to make sure that, you know, the statisticians of each team are really on point. And we've got some logistical 
hurdles to overcome there, but that combination is going to be really good. We, we are hopeful that there's another uh, area of, of online, uh, how do I say it without giving it away? We're researching another avenue where, you know, we can monetize the online presence of our game. And one of the things we're going to do, which I don't know if we touched on it earlier, is we're going to have weekly injury reports, you know, kind of like what the NFL does. We're going to have the, 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 the game recaps, the game previews. Obviously, we're going to have NAL Live every week, so that's going to be a large part of that. But we also want to have a section where we're going to have actual injury reports you know, in the past, as a coach, coaches like to like hold off certain injuries until the game day, make teams prepare for them. But we need to do better. And it's not doing better, but we need to be more transparent when it comes to the injuries so that, you know, we can be more attractive to other avenues of generating revenue online. And part of that is, hey, if a guy, if your quarterback's injured and he's doubtful for the game on Saturday, our weekly injury report, whether that's Wednesday or Thursday, he needs to be on there as doubtful. You know, people need to be able to adjust their fantasy football rosters and yep. you know, if we ever are able to bet on it online. So, you know, we got to do those things the right way and yeah. that's hard to be more transparent. I know like with, you know, NAL live, I mean, it might be something different during the season, but you know, the plan with uh, the coaches, coaches on Tuesdays, the players of the weeks, maybe uh, uh, on Wednesday, the fantasy report and the injury report. I mean, it's going to be some great content out there at different spots. Um, now until the season, we're planning to do at least two shows a week um, on NAL live, which will be on Facebook. We're on Facebook, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, Twitch right now. So um, people can tune in there. Um, Dave has a question. I think you answered it that you don't have it finalized, but will games be on YouTube or Facebook live this season? They're definitely going to be streamed live. Uh, the, the past couple of years, we've used YouTube, and it's possible that uh, that it could be YouTube. But we're we're looking into every option for how to stream it online. So we definitely want to have it available to the fans live. Uh, some teams still have some regional, local type TV stuff, uh, but yeah, that's definitely part of it. We want to make sure that the fans have access to the games. Uh, live streaming, you know, everything seems to be going streaming. I don't even have cable or satellite TV anymore. I, I stream my television. And yeah. I think that's the future. We just got to figure out what's the best way. YouTube has been pretty good. And, you know, uh, you know, we also have to look at other avenues of doing that. But uh, you know, whatever the best for the fans and for the league is what we're going to do. Well, and I think, you know, talking yeah. about like broadcast, like back in the day, it was all about like getting on TV. You know, that was where it was at. Well, now you can reach so many more people digitally. And, you know, I don't think there's as much value in that. Obviously, you you know, it's great to say you're on ESPN or, or whatever uh, network. But, um, you know, with all the digital resources, I mean, you know, the NBA, they, they, they stream a lot of their games on uh, the G League on Twitch, which is a platform more for, you know, set up for gaming and, and the younger the younger crew. They do stuff on Twitter. So, I mean, there's so many different avenues that we can reach a lot of people. Dave also asked about the stats being posted timely. I know you had mentioned yeah. something about live stats or or updated stats, so that's going to be a big thing for the league. Absolutely. The, the stats will be updated live in real time, and there'll be a link on the uh, league website where you can follow along. So if your favorite team is Albany and they're playing in Orlando, you'll be able to follow along live. Uh, and look at the stats in real time. That's that's a big thing for us for 2021. Uh, and a lot in conjunction with that would be the fantasy football for those those people that uh, you know are playing fantasy football. So, but yeah, definitely live stats. You know, be a you know websites kind of it's already being built to have the the link. You know, and as somebody scores, you know, like like the college game or the NFL game, you see the, you see the ball kind of going along the field. The same concept for us. You know, you can see the play by play put in there. Uh, but that takes hard work on the statistician's part, and we've got to make sure each team is on point with that uh, to make sure it, it, it works seamlessly. So uh, great question, Dave. I appreciate it. And that's definitely what I want to add for the fans. And that, that's the other thing, too, when it comes to the fans. You know, if, if fans have ideas that are, you know, that we need to either improve on or that 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 they'd like to see happen, you know, they can always uh, – they can always email Stephen Chitola at Stephen at National Radio League. Uh, <laughs> that poor kid. Come on. 
Steven Chitola does a great job. Uh, they can email me as well. My email so, can be found on the league website. One or two more things quick. Um, with the um, fantasy football, will did you say something about like potentially betting or would that not be tied yeah, in with? I, I don't know. I, but that's a work in progress. Uh, okay. You know, we've got to explore again, you know, for, for us, you know, we rely on the fans and, and the sponsors. You know, we, we, as much as we would love that, we would welcome television revenue or revenue from, you know, national sponsors. You know, we have very little right now. I should say very little. We have a few sponsors, but we're not enough to fund all of the teams without fans. And it, even if we had that kind of funds to, to have games without fans, I, I don't know of any owners in our league that want that. So, we truly rely on fans and local money for this to be successful. You know, you're, you're, you're familiar with how the budgets in these leagues work and it just doesn't work without the fans, you know, yeah, uh, gotta have them. And, and if there's no fans, then, you know, sponsors, you know, some sponsors are relying on the fans being at the games too. others. It's a little bit different for them. You know, obviously the engagement online and the eyeballs on the game, we can monetize that. But it's still, you know, the, the fans need to be there. You know, we love the fans, and, and the game's just better with the fans. So, uh, you know, long term, got to have the fans there. And uh, but some great questions out there. You know, La last one we talked about, but I'll just recap real quick. They said, "Why Ontario? Why Ontario, California?" You you kind of mentioned, you know, quality ownership group. You know, great facility. Um, you know, and just kind of talked about those travel concerns. Anything you want to throw in there real quick? Just well, Let's just say we have some plans behind that move. <laughs> and, sure. uh, you know, this owner is a great owner, and I've got to know him over the past uh, few weeks. And he's been on point with everything that he's done. Uh, been very impressed with him. And uh, he's got a lot of great ideas for us as well. So it, it's not just a matter of, you know, you know, why Ontario? I mean, he's he's got a great opportunity out there, and that comes with some, let's say, residual benefits in the future. You know, uh, so we're we're trying to grow this league, you know, and uh, you know. Now you got to just fill in from the west coast to the east coast. I mean, that's yeah. obviously yeah, I'm absolutely. sure the plan over the next few years. So, but we we want you know we want to grow with good partners, and you know we'd like to see we believe. We'll have 12 teams in 2020. You know, we have a number of teams that are waiting for 2022, I meant. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, a number of teams that uh, are making application over the next few weeks. A couple of applications already in. Uh, obviously, we're not going to be announcing any more teams before it happens, before everything is in place. But, uh, you know, we have some a lot of interest for 2022 and, and uh, we just got to have a good successful 2021 and, you know, work on the things that, that, you know, we need to be improved, you know, introduce the fantasy football, get more fan engagement, get this NAL live podcast hosted by Andrew Haynes, rocking and rolling. I got the face for it, man. It's Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so is that a whiteboard? Or you just write on your wall. Um, I said, it's, a it's a see through whiteboard that my okay. wife got me. I got another one on the other side and uh, I had to erase some stuff before the show. <laughs> like potential cities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah. So it, it, it's, it's, it's actually a whiteboard that, you know, I don't know if you can see me put my hand behind oh, yeah. it. Not a whiteboard. It's a dry erase board. But it's like a glass dry erase board, dry erase board. So it's super cool. My wife's always keeping me organized or at least, trying to keep me organized. It's good that we got good ladies behind us, man, or we wouldn't be anywhere Listen, close to where we are. <laughs> she's the boss. I'm actually behind her. Yeah, exactly. She's, exactly. She's okay. boss. Last thing, your, your favorite place on the road to play and your least favorite place to play and why? Is when you were coaching. When I was coaching? Yeah. Or playing. My favorite place to play on the road, ah oh, man, and my least favorite. That's a good one because uh, I, you know, it's hard to answer that question because I don't want to call any teams out because my favorite <laughs> places were the ones where I had the most success, you know. 
Uh, I, I, you know, I'll tell you a great place. It could have been the best and the worst, and that was Tulsa, Oklahoma. Okay. Uh, it was the, uh, and I got to be honest, if there's ever any fans listening to the show, Tulsa and their old arena, they were so loud, and they had these uh, air horns and all this other stuff, and it was so loud and so annoying. It was very difficult to hear and play there. But I looked up in the rule book, and you couldn't have any artificial noisemakers. So when I was coaching in Arkansas, uh, I went to the officials before the game. I was like, hey, by the way, see this rule in the rule book. And they're like, well, let us know. And the first first offensive series, is I'm on a sideline. This guy's blowing a horn, and I'm trying to keep a straight face like it doesn't bother me. Meanwhile, I'm going deaf in my ear. <laughs> so I kind of whispered to the official, hey, you know, uh, they got these air horns. You know those are illegal. He goes, yeah, yeah, I'll take care of it, coach. And a couple plays later, they made the announcement, and the fans were like, oh, man, what's going on? I was like, man, I don't know, because that was awesome. I mean, you guys are so loud. <laughs> All of a sudden, the decibel levels go down. You know, it's like I guess Oregon has that that stadium that the way it's constructed is really loud. with well, Tulsa the same way. So, it, what it was, was that arena called? Do you remember that? Was that the Cox Arena? Because there's like two arenas. No, it was the first arena. The second arena was the Box Center. Uh, okay, it, so there's it's another like one that's like because I lost there, but it's I like got a bigger arena. floor. <laughs> yeah, but their first arena was so loud, and you know, it was one of those older arenas, and the fans. Some of there were some great fans there, so. I actually really enjoyed uh, going to Tulsa. The place I hated the most was was probably Tennessee Valley. Uh, they had some they had some good fans there too. They had some good refs too. So. <laughs> See, when you lose, it's never about your team. It's always about the ref. No, the damn refs. I, that's what I like about not owning a team right now is I can't get fined for bashing the refs on uh, online. I guess I can't on here either since I'm well, actually. Least, Working with the league. <laughs> Actually, Andrew, you might need to read the fine print of our deal here. <laughs> nope, I can't talk about officials. Damn it. <laughs> now, I always said that those officials should do a combine, and we should post the results. I want to see them run the 40. I want to see them do a shuttle because some of these guys. <laughs> I will tell you this much about the officials. You know, Our supervisor officials, Joe Clarkson, he's done a fantastic job with these guys. Yeah. And, you know, what you got to understand is this game, and the fans need to understand, this game is so fast for the officials. It actually helps train them for the outdoor game. Yeah. Most of our officials are Division One uh, college officials. Some of them are Division Two college officials. And they're very, very good. And, and sometimes some of the nuances of the rules they need to learn. And it's a learning process for them as well. When we get to the playoffs, we take the best of the best officials and – you know, the officiating crews are basically all-star crews during the playoffs. So uh, they're not without fault. And one area that we're different, you know, when officials make really bad calls, they get, you know, suspended, sometimes fined, and sometimes fired. I mean, and, and in the past as a coach, you never knew, you, you know, you get the letter from the league, oh, we're sorry, you were right, you know, blah, blah, blah. But that doesn't change the outcome of the game. Right. In our game, officials actually – they get suspended for a few games and they're held accountable. They're held to a very high standard. And uh, I'm very proud of the job that our officials have done each year. It gets better. Has, was it great early on? No, but each year it gets better. And that's all we can ask for. We, we have to have them grow with us They're You know, uh, so that's one of those areas. The officials don't want to be part of the outcome of the game. They don't want to be no. the deciding factor. They want to leave it on the field, just like the players and coaches and fans do. And they've got a difficult job too. They might be the only ones that get booed more than me. So <laughs> I appreciate the officials for that. <laughs> yeah. For some well, games, that's not the case. It might be me, but you know, that's the part of the game I don't like. I don't like getting booed. You know, it hurts I, no I kind of like that when I'm on the road as a visiting team. That's I, different. That's different. Well, yeah. <laughs> I get booed everywhere I go, man. You know, <laughs> yeah. Not in Orlando. Orlando hasn't booed me not yet. I mean, right. it's coming. We'll get off. that chant going. We'll we'll have like a a video ready to play. Get yeah. a, get get that for you. But I mean, but I love the game. I'm involved because I love the game, and yeah, you know, I really like where we're going. You know, to kind of summarize everything. And yep. uh, although I don't like getting booed, I also understand the passion of the fans and I hope they understand that, you know, I've got a job, a job to do. And ultimately I work for the owners. So if you're going to boo me, you're booing the owners. So, uh, yeah, you know, but I, you know, I could take it and, uh, you know, 
I just want to see this job special and get bigger and better. And, and I just want to see it be stable and, and be here for, for 20, 30, 40 years down the road. We just want to see this game last and survive. Yeah. It's such a great game. I think you and the owners are headed in the right direction. You acknowledge there's still a long ways to go. There's, there's a lot that you guys are working on, but um, you guys are trying to make it better each each day, each season. So um, I'm excited to be part of that as as we uh, try to help grow it. So thanks again. Tomorrow, this will be on Spotify and all the platforms. Um, what do we got here? What do you got oh, there? I'm going to get my boy up here. Oh, okay. My little boy. You got your, you got your uh... – One of my two boys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is Max. <laughs> oh, wow. Hey, my boy. Let me get you. Ooh, <laughs> So there you go. Yeah, it's my, no, man. Thank, it's my thanks for thanks for joining me. Thanks for allowing me to be part of it with you. So yeah, excited man. to see you guys tomorrow night as well. Absolutely. Thanks, Andrew. And tell the fans, normal days of this show are going to be what? Tuesdays, Wednesdays? Tuesdays and Wednesdays, yep. Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Yep. This is kind of a kickoff show. And, you know, it'll be nice when we get hundreds of thousands of viewers at the same time. So, you know, uh, fans, how can they reach you for – uh, show ideas and, and stuff, Andrew. What how, what email can they reach you at? I uh, bombard you with questions and stuff. No, I mean, you know, you can just find me on social media, Andrew G. Haynes. You can message me on on anything there, Twitter, um, you know, LinkedIn, whatever, uh, Facebook. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to hear back. I mean, this is all for the fans. So the more that we can do, obviously, I'm not like a 20 year career uh, media person. So um, bear with me. You know, I, I, I have a passion for the game. I've been around it in, in every aspect. So, um, you know, I'll try to try to get you the, the good information and, and have a have a fun time. Sounds good, Andrew. Thank you so much for putting this together. And uh, we're excited about seeing this NAO live take off and seeing what levels you can take it to, brother.